Hi, folks. My name is Joshua Brandon, and I am sitting here with the one, the only, the writer and director of Clue, Mr. Jonathan Lynn. We're going to start the movie in just a moment. You're not going to see anything, but you just play along at home and you'll be able to hear the director's thoughts. And I might maybe pop in from time to time. We're going to give you two sync moments. We're going to say one, two, three, play. And on play, we're going to start our movie and you're going to start yours. And then we're going to give you another sync point when Mr. Lin's name comes up as directed by Jonathan Lin. So if you thought you were off by a second or so, we'll tell you when that happens and you can hit play or pause or fast forward or whatever you need to do. So ready? One, two, three, play. Well, I didn't shoot this bit. (laughs) This is Paramount logo, as you can see. And um, this title sequence was a bit of a bone of contention between me and and, uh, Paramount because they wouldn't give me any money for a title sequence. So they told me to do the... do it all on white letters and black cards, and I didn't want to do that because I thought it needed atmosphere. So desperately I searched for some clouds in stock, and uh, we used that for the start of the titles. And then I used the driving up to the house sequence with titles over, although that had not been planned to use titles with that. Um... And you hear John Morris's wonderful score. John was suggested as the composer by a friend, and he'd done, I think, all of Mel Brooks's movies, or certainly most of them. And um, this, of course, was the days before synthesizers and electronic music. So what you're hearing is a live orchestra. And he played the score to me first on the piano, and we talked it through and we talked about orchestrations and how it was all to sound. And then the first time I heard it was at the recording, which was the way it used to be. And so this scene, although it's got titles over it, wasn't designed to have titles over it. It was supposed to be the beginning of the film after the title sequence. But So here's Wordsworth driving up to the house. Tim Curry and I knew each other from very long ago. Um, we were at the same school He was 12 and I was 14 when we first met. And um, he told me once he became an actor because I did, so he realized it could happen. This picture of the house is about painting. Um, It was painted on glass by uh, Albert Whitlock, who did all of Hitchcock's movies. He was great. This shot was from the roof of a real mansion in Pasadena, which I'm told is now burned down. Yeah, burned down in a fire. Now, now this is not the real mansion. This forecourt was built as part of this studio set. The whole of the house, apart from the conserved, apart from the ballroom, is a set, including this forecourt where the cars parked and the dogs are. Um, This opening joke is one that I've always regretted. Uh, The stepping in the dog poo was suggested by the head of the studio, Dawn Steele, and I thought she knew what she was doing. It was my first film. I I didn't know anything. So um, I put this joke in, and unfortunately I shot it in such a way that I couldn't remove it later, (laughs) a mistake I wouldn't make with subsequent films. Um, Directed by Jonathan Lynn. There's your second sync point, folks. Sorry to interrupt. Go on. So... Anyway, that, that's this joke, which we were stuck with forever, and some people love it. Um, but it's slightly out of keeping with the rest of the style of the film. Um, we shot this scene with the dogs the first day, and it was very hard because the dogs, you know, didn't really understand continuity. <laughs> and uh, so we were behind schedule from day one. We didn't get our first day, which was, you know, a big problem. So I was always catching up after that. Um, And now we're in this set, which was a huge and wonderful set built by, designed and built by John Lloyd. And uh, it cost a million dollars, I think, this set. And we were shooting on stage 16 at Paramount, which is where Hitchcock shot Real Window. It's the biggest stage. This is Colleen Camp as Yvette. She was great.
And there's Tim on the way to the kitchen. We'll cut back to the library, I think that room is. The um, Here's Curl Mustard. I wanted a sort of film noir feel about that opening shot when the colonel arrives. Now, it was often mentioned to me that they should have been dressed in their colours. Miss Scarlet should have been dressed in scarlet, Colonel Mustard in mustard, Professor Plum in plum colours and so forth. That really missed the whole point of the fact that these characters have aliases which are given to them by Wadsworth. So their names are fake names and therefore their costumes would not reflect those colours and I made sure that they didn't. If I'm not mistaken, though, some of their cars match those colours, right? Um, you could be right about that. I don't remember. Yes, I think that's right. Now, here's Mrs. White. This is Madeline Kahn. And uh, her part was a lot smaller when she read the script. And to my great surprise and pleasure, she said she'd like to be in it. So I wrote up the part of Mrs. White. Most of Mrs. White's part was written after I knew Madeline was uh, cast and, and wanted to do the movie. So it was very much written with her in mind. None of the other parts were really. All the other parts were written and cast according to how they were written. So here we are. This was shot in Franklin Canyon, I think, um, in Los Angeles. And this is where Miss Scarlet meets Professor Plum. I'd seen um, Christopher Lloyd in uh, Taxi and thought he was very funny, and which is uh, one of the reasons I was interested in him. Leslie Ann was cast very much at the last minute. It was going to be Carrie Fisher, uh, who had done a very funny audition. But then uh, a week before we started shooting, she went into rehab. I didn't know she had a drug problem. She sniffed a lot, but she told me it was hay fever. And I was naive and from London, and I believed it. I didn't know that just about everybody connected with the film was snorting cocaine, which is apparently a great many of them were. Eileen was a very funny actress. Now, here we are. All of this, of course, is, a, is artificial rain because we're inside a studio set. Michael McKeon is Mr. Green. And uh, the board game, which I played the game when we grew up, when I was growing up. And in England, uh, Mr. Green is called the Reverend Green. Uh, yeah, same but, in Australia. But in uh, in America, he's Mr. Green. So that's what we did because this was an American movie. And I think in England, as well as Sydney, Australia, where I'm from, it's Cluedo. Cluedo, that's right, yeah. yes. I don't know where the game was invented. I think maybe in England. I've read a great many people for all of the parts, met a lot of people, and Colleen, uh, um, Colleen came in to read and she, she, she just was funny.
the um, this The, um, we had eight weeks to shoot this film and the schedule was very difficult to stick to because most films, actually, no matter how big the cast of extras or small parts, have only a handful of leading actors and usually not more than two or three in a scene. This film has seven or eight principals in virtually every scene, which means that you have to do an awful lot of what's called coverage. Um close-ups and two shots as well as bigger wide shots and so the um, the shooting script really had to be meticulously planned in advance but we didn't storyboard it we just made a lot of notes Victor Kemper and I Victor was the cinematographer and he did a superb job and we essentially planned all the shots in advance so of course you vary them a bit when you see what the actors are doing The film has a long way to go in terms of building hysteria, and so, you know, it had to start fairly small and quiet, and with a lot of pauses when people try to, s try to figure out who the other characters are and what they're doing there and why. Nobody knows. So it, this is the scene in which they all discover that they're connected with Washington or with the government. And this means that they all have something to hide because the film is set in 1954 at the height of McCarthyism, investigations by the House Un-American Activities Committee. Um, Colonel Mustard, it turns out, has been a, um, a war profiteer. Um, Mrs. Peacock is the wife of a corrupt senator, which, of course, is unthinkable today. <laughs> Um, Miss Scarlet runs a escort service, as it would now be called, in Washington. Um, all of these things, of course, are still still around in Washington, D.C. today. Nothing has really changed, except the McCarthyism has slightly gone away. What made you decide to use McCarthyism and the Red Scare as a, as a backdrop? Well, the reason was that uh, in the, the whole country house murder mystery genre is a period thing. It was more or less invented by Agatha Christie and Dorothy L. Sayers and one or two other people. And it, it doesn't really, it didn't really hold up in the modern world. I felt it had to be a period film. And in order to make it a period film, it had to be about some period in American history, somewhere between the 20s and the 50s. I happen to know about the 1950s and McCarthyism because a great many expatriate American writers and directors landed up in England when I was a young man, uh, fleeing from political persecution in America. Uh, Carl Foreman, who did The Bridge on the River Kwai, mm. Donald Ogden Stewart, who wrote The Philadelphia Story, Waldo Salt, who later wrote Midnight Cowboy, Ring Lardner, who later wrote M.A.S.H., Charlie Chaplin. I knew all these people in London when I was young, when I was a young actor. 
So I was very well educated in this period of American history. And it made it possible for me to use this as the basis for the plot. In the original screenplay and in my original intentions, there was quite a lot of Senator Joe McCarthy and the Army McCarthy hearings in the Senate on TV. But it somehow in the need to create momentum and keep the film moving very fast when we cut it, that all got taken out. I think it was a mistake that we took it out. Hmm. Mr. Body was originally written for a very upscale gentleman who would have uh, owned this mansion. Paramount wanted me to cast Lee Ving because he was uh, very... Uh, he had a hit record in the Billboard charts at the time. So Mr. Body was transformed into a, a more downscale character than he had originally been conceived as. So I was telling you about uh, how Carrie Fisher dropped out of the mm. film at the last minute. I was very lucky to get Leslie Ann Warren at the last minute, who I thought gave a wonderful performance as Miss Scarlet. Had you... Most of these actors I didn't know. I, I lived in England. I'd hardly seen any of them except one or two of them on American TV series. So they were just people who came in to meet um, and who I liked the most for the parts when I met them. A great many people seemed to like the script and wanted to be in it. This house, by the way, which is called Hill House, uh, was of course named after the producer Deborah Hill, who originally had the idea of making this film. Did you have a chance to rehearse a bunch before you started? Yes, we had a week's rehearsal. Uh, this film would have been impossible without rehearsal. Um, we started off by looking at the, a great old classic, His Girl Friday, mm. with Cary Grant and Russell and Russell, and I said to them that this is the pace which we were aiming at. A very, very fast dialogue and very speedy and no time for the audience to think. Um, and we did manage to maintain that pace. We may even have made it a little too fast for the audience. I think when I saw it with audiences, they didn't get all the jokes because they went so quickly. I think, on the other hand, that's been the reason why it's been one of the reasons why it's been so popular ever since, because people watch it again and again and find new jokes every time they see it. Absolutely. You know, I, I have a copy of the script, and it's even it's frenetic in the third act like that. Every word Wadsworth says is connected with a dash in between just yes. to emphasize how fast it all is. Again, there's that great score. It's really just playing an entire part there. Yes, it's a wonderful score. Now, Jonathan, you're a musician too. Did you have a lot to do with sort of crafting the score? With No, I, I didn't have anything to do with crafting it. He's the composer, but right. of course I made suggestions. Um, but it's all John Morris's work. Uh, I think it was maybe easier for him because when he played it to me on the piano and we talked about the orchestrations, I knew what it would end up sounding like, right. roughly. It was quite funny because when we were recording it, the producer, Peter Goober, phoned me and said, uh, how's the music? <laughs> and I said, it's fine. He said, it's not great. And I said, it's fine. I didn't know that great was the minimum adjective of praise <laughs> in Hollywood. I thought great applied to Beethoven and Mozart. So half an hour later, his Ferrari shot into the parking lot of the studio <laughs> where we were recording. He came running in saying, the music isn't great. Why isn't it great? And I said, it's fine, it's fine. It's, it's great, Peter, it's great. <laughs> I just want to make a quick note here. Everybody's drinking champagne. That will become important because we will try to cram in a very quick discussion on the fourth ending 
which of course is not in the film. We'll talk about that towards the end if we can. <laughs> That's a line I didn't catch until like the fourth or fifth year right. of this movie. Well, you know, the, the, this film is full of political satire. Yeah. Although people think of it as a kind of silly kids movie, but it's there's a lot of political satire in this. I think that's one of the reasons it sort of continues to work. I saw it for the first time when I was a kid and then you keep watching it over and over again. You get older and you get all these jokes you didn't get before, but it works on all those yes. levels. Well, here's Mrs. Peacock essentially admitting that uh, her husband, the senator, took bribes. <laughs> Something that, of course, is unthinkable in the modern world. <laughs> They don't need to be bribes anymore, of course. Now that's all political action committees and it's legal. So all of that talk about double negatives and proof positive and photographs is all, of course, word games. Um, it, it's, it's always been one of my ambitions to make very silly but intelligent films. Um, the Mark Brothers were heroes of mine when I was young and and you can you can make a film that's both broadly funny and highly intelligent simultaneously. This is another one of those great wordplay moments coming up with the threat to kill him in public. So was Leslie Ann there during the rehearsal process or did she join after that? Oh, no, no, she was there for the rehearsal. So just in time for that. Yeah. You can tell me if this is right. I read something that Rowan Atkinson was originally considered for the Wadsworth role. Yes, he was. Um, I wrote the part originally for an English actor who's long dead, but you can see him in a lot of Stanley Kubrick films called Leonard Rossiter. Mm who I'd worked with, and he was a huge star in England. It was very, very funny. I'd hoped to persuade Paramount and John Landis to cast him. Um, that, well, Leonard died. I suggested Rowan, who was very popular in Britain, but Paramount refused to consider him. They, I don't think they even looked at the showreel that he sent me. Wow. Um, and then Tim was mentioned, and I knew Tim, and I thought that was a wonderful idea. So I was very happy with the uh, finished with the finished casting. I mean, it's like any of these movies. You look at it and you can't imagine anyone else in that role. But, of course, obviously other people came very close. So that's an old move from the Three Stooges, the two fingers in the eyes. And here's an old move that's yeah. very, very old. Now, John Landis was originally going to direct this, right? John was going to direct I wrote it for John. Right. I would have written it probably differently if I was known I was going to direct it. I'd never directed a film. 
Um, I was directing at the National Theatre in London at the time. And then um, John couldn't direct it or chose not to, I don't know which, but he, in the intervening time between my writing it and uh, the film being ready to make, John had other commitments. And he very kindly said to me, would you like to direct it? And I'll be one of the producers. So, of course, I said yes. And the original story is uh, shared between John and me and, and very... That's a very accurate credit. John did a tremendously complicated pitch in which he described many of the events, most of the events that happen in the movie. Um, and it was a very impressive pitch. He ran around his office and shouted and screamed and jumped on the furniture. And, and I was on the edge of my seat. And finally, we came to the moment when Wadsworth said, now I can tell you who did it. I know who did it. And I said, who? And he said, I don't know. That's why I need a writer. <laughs> so at that, at that point, I realized there were a lot of incidents, but no actual story because, as Graham Greene famously said, character is plot. Hmm. There were no characters. They were just names and colors. Right. So what made this film very difficult to write was that it it, it had many ingredients that had to be in it because um, Parker Brothers, who invented the game, insisted on that. So we had to have all nine rooms. We had to have the secret passages. We had to have the weapons. We had to have the characters with these ridiculous names. And some explanations had to be found for it all. So right. the, the problem in writing the script was to come up with something, come up with a story using all of the ingredients of the game, using John Landis's events, and I had to put coherence and make sense of all of this and do that, you know, with the action and the dialogue, inventing the action and the dialogue. So it was a very difficult job. And I, I gather I was the sixth writer wow. on the project. I think there were five before me, one of whom was Tom Stoppard. They all gave up at various points. I didn't know any of this, until long after I made the film. So you never I, saw any of the early drafts? I saw no other drafts. I, I thought I was the only writer. And here we go. That shot just reminded me of um, uh, Dial in for Murder. Sort of overhead shot. Is there an overhead shot like that in Dial? Yeah. I mean, I don't remember. Because uh, just, it just it's such a long me. time ago that I sure. shot this, but I certainly would have seen Devil Dial in for Murder. And you know, this film is a is a it's not anything like a Hitchcock film because Hitchcock never made a Who Done It. He made what he calls suspense films, which meant that you always knew who the bad guy was right. by halfway through the film, if not usually within five or ten minutes. You know, in North by Northwest, you know who it is from the beginning. Right. Strangers on the Train you know who the bad guy is from the beginning. So his films are suspense films. This is a parody of a whodunit. Um, this is one of and those I, It had to be made broadly comic because, of course, a whodunit is such an intrinsically ridiculous genre. <laughs> Looked like he really hit her there. Yes, he didn't really hit her. <laughs> You, he couldn't possibly have done that. It would have <laughs> knocked her out. And Eileen was rather fragile. She'd had a car accident shortly right. before we made the film. I think this was the first film she made after a serious car accident. She'd been hospitalised. Wow. It's funny when you were talking about having to put all the pieces together and and figure out a way to make it cohesive, to do that and to also have to come up with four different endings that could all theoretically work. I mean, I don't know how... I don't know how you even wrap your head around something like that. Uh, it took a lot of planning. Uh, the writing of the film, the actual writing, was very brief. It was probably 
three weeks, but about a week for each act. The first act, I would say, is up to when Mr. Body's found dead. Second act is the whole of the middle of the film. The third act is Wadsworth's explanation. Right. But between those three weeks of writing was months of sitting around making notes, making drawings, mm -hmm. planning who could be where on the set, you know, in the house so that you wouldn't miss them and so that each of the explanations would make sense, that somebody was missing from a crucial shot. Right. Uh, it was very hard to plan. And it meant that improv was essentially impossible during the making of the film because the slightest deviation could have screwed up the the um, explanations at the end. Of course, yeah. Which, which there wasn't one explanation, there were four different explanations. Three finally in the film, but four were shot. So what? nothing much could be changed. It was too dangerous. Nobody could think it through fast enough. Right. Well, I was just thinking also, you were saying you were making drawings. In theory, you've got all the rooms that are on the clue board or the Cluedo board, but yes. you've got two extra floors here because you also have people in the cellar and you've got people on the second floor. That's right. Whew. I loved Madeleine Kahn. I thought she was absolutely wonderful. Mm. She was a joy to work with. They were all terrific to work with. I mean, they were just the nicest, the nicest cast. So, some of them were, I've been in touch with ever since. Colleen remained a friend all, all my life up to now. And I acted in a play with Michael. I directed a play recently with Michael McKean. The speech, of course, is all about how socialism is so unacceptable in America, and I think has remained the case up to the present day. If you hear, um, <laughs> you hear Chris Matthews talking about Bernie Sanders and saying how incredible it is that a socialist should be running for president, it strikes me as something from the Dark Ages. I love that reaction for Mrs. Peacock. Yeah, makes sense. Yeah. Make some money from it. Yeah, here it is. <laughs> I mean, of course, in 1954, at the height of McCarthyism. Yes, but it's not all that different today, I'm right. very sorry to say. There's a great contrast here be between how Mrs. White is really feeling this and, and being there for Wadsworth, and then <laughs> you look at Colonel Mustard and he's frightfully bored by the whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> and again, these are things I didn't pick up until I'd seen the movie half a dozen times, some of them. So now, this whole set existed as just on the one stage you were saying so literally you'd be off the hall and then you'd go shoot in the study yes though we would in fact shoot all the study scenes at the same time and then all the kitchen scenes at the same time and so forth um we didn't start out that way we decided to shoot in continuity because the plot was so complex but as we got behind schedule it became clear that we could no longer shoot in continuity so by the time we were halfway through the film we were shooting out of continuity, and finally, in the last week or two, we shot everything in the hall out of sequence. So, because it took about three hours to light the hall in any direction, mm. we would shoot everything looking towards the front door from maybe ten scenes, and then everything looking towards the kitchen, the other end, <laughs> from the same ten scenes. And the actors were really confused, and quite understandably so. Fortunately, I knew the script so well that I was able to make sure that everything they did made sense. But it was not easy for them. I love the way Michael plays this moment. <laughs> 
And obviously all of this is shot specifically so that the people who aren't supposed to be there are subtly just missing. Yes, that's yeah. right. See, Professor Plum's not here now, even though he was at the beginning, and he'll show up again in just a minute. Yes. She gets them a couple of times with those. And now Plum's back. Actually, uh, she and Mrs. Peacock well. is back, yeah, of course. which she wasn't there before. That's right. But there's, you know, it, it did require a lot of careful planning to make sure that we didn't make any mistakes in all of that because you couldn't correct it later. Right. But obviously it doesn't play like you notice they're missing. No, obviously just, on purpose. Yeah. Now here we... we uh, we we carried in uh, we carried her in there and and of course the sound when her head hits the floor is a sound effect uh, it didn't really hurt her but later when we drag her across the carpet it was impossible she was a big lady oh wow and um, so I she was on a little a little dolly with wheels <laughs> when we dragged her across the carpet I had no idea and, well of course not yeah that's great. And, uh, <laughs> well, I say I had no idea because I've done a lot of research and I've seen the movie a million times, but I still didn't know that one, so that's great. There are discussion boards all over the internet with fans discussing the endings and all the little intricate parts of the film. I mean, yes, I have never seen any of those. I had no idea about that. Yeah. I love how she plays that so straight. You always play comedy straight. Of course, yeah. It's never... Uh, comedy is only funny if people... if people are completely emotionally involved with what they're acting. Um, if people are aware that they're funny, they stop being funny. What's interesting to me is how much innuendo, sexual innuendo there is in this film, and yet people have always considered it suitable for children. Right. Well, I guess aside from this... I think this, it's because they just don't understand, the children don't understand it. I didn't. And I was no. going to say, apart from that blood there, there's not much blood in the movie that's full No, of there was one other big bloody shot, but I took it out for, to get the rating, the PG rating. What was that shot? When the motorist is killed. Oh, right. That falling into the arm shot was a tricky shot to do because it's widescreen, you know, and that would have been funnier. It is funny, but we, we took a lot of planning to to make it work in widescreen when you can't really see them full figure. Sure. Oh, how did you time this with the candlestick? I cued the candlestick at the right moment. Well, so somebody's just, like, pulling a string on it or something? Yes. Right. Behind that candlestick is a little hole in the wall. Huh. Uh, so on cue, they pushed it. <laughs> and, of course, it wasn't a brass candlestick, it's a rubber candlestick. And there she's on a dolly. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> I guess you just don't think of that, but it makes sense. I love the way when he's on the couch with them. Professor Plum is so lecherous, he, he even pats the cook's butt. There's a bit from the trailer I remember where he says, I'm, I'm looking, I'm looking, or something like that, specifically looking into Yvette's cleavage. 
Uh, and it's not in the film? No, it's on the trailer. It's yes. the one special feature on the Blu-ray, the trailer. There are so many... Um, there are so m- there, We cut a lot, obviously, sure. as everyone does when you put the film together. You, you cut scenes that you that you like. I don't think that's luxury. I think he's just looking for somewhere to put his hand. <laughs> I think the costumes are wonderful. Michael Kaplan, a young costume designer who's since become one of the top costume designers in Hollywood, did all these great costumes. And it's really important because, of course, nobody changes throughout the pictures. Right. So your image of these characters is the image that you have for the whole film. And this is Jeffrey Kramer as the motorist. He was a friend of the producer, Deborah Hill. And uh, he was... That's how he got in to meet me, and he later became a very successful producer. That's right, he produced Alan McBeal, The Practice, a bunch of other shows like that. Yeah. Before this, he was very briefly in Jaws. I know, because he told me when I met him. So back on the costumes, the the sort of headpiece that Miss uh, Mrs. Peacock is wearing. Yes. Did you guys figure early on that hey, we can do something with this because it just you know brushes into her face a couple of times? Uh, no, Eileen uh, invented all that. Right. This was tricky. We threw that away, and we tried to get a shot of that key landing, and it kept n- not being on camera. <laughs> it kept being in between the frames. Right. <laughs> we had to do that shot <laughs> several times. It should have been the easiest thing in the world, but it was a very right. difficult one to to get. I don't know why. Just a regular key. You didn't just didn't regular a heavy key. key or anything. Not a special effect. No. There was nothing digital in those days. You didn't do, you couldn't digitally invent a key and sure. put it in there. You had to shoot it. This is one of my favorite visual. I things. love this. Martin, this was Martin's uh, gag, <laughs> pouring it like an army officer. That's great. Uh. Oh, and this wordplay is spectacular. What does that mean? No, v, uh, no, nouveau, nouveau riche, riche oblige. oblige. Well, uh, um, uh, don't know how to explain that one. Um, there is a French expression, noblesse oblige which means that n- the nobility are obliged to do things for other people. Mm. Noblesse oblige. This is obviously a house belonging not to a nobleman, but to somebody who's nouveau riche. Ah. So I changed the expression to nouveau riche oblige. It's a very arcane, esoteric joke for a handful of people who would get it. Right.
So, <laughs> so we move the action back to the kitchen and then there's the drawing of the lots, which um, we were very short of time shooting this bit, but fortunately we got it all in one shot, which I was very pleased about, this, uh, this shot that's coming up. It would have been an awful bore if we'd had to put it together slowly. Right. And everybody just knew which... Yes, everyone knew which one to take. Right. And so we rehearsed it once and then... And then did it, and it all just worked. You know, the cast were just wonderful. I think we did it in one take, and uh, somehow everybody found themselves in exactly the right position at every moment in this rather complicated shot. It looks, of course, it looks effortless. The thing about comedy is that it has to look effortless, and therefore people think it is. Right. Right, but just because something is simple doesn't mean it's easy. Usually the opposite. Right. <laughs> now, is the upstairs actually connected as well? No, the upstairs, this is a set, so the sure. upstairs was a different set. Right, right. Well, no, the landing was, was connected. But the actual rooms, there. But the rooms else. upstairs were separate. And the cellar downstairs was separate. This is all connected. This is all the same main set. It was an enormous set. Yeah. And, and I, then when they go up those, that, those stairs, then they go onto a different set. And I guess a lot of the time, because everything was connected, you would have to shoot with four walls a lot, right? Yes, they were, we, the walls were all capable of flying, I think, but we practically never flew a wall out. It was just too time-consuming. Mm -hmm. the, the film was taking too long to shoot, um, just because of the immense amount of time required to light these huge rooms. Um, and because of the enormous amount of coverage with s seven or eight people in every scene, you could do a master, but you also you know, had to do some, a lot of close-ups and a lot of reaction shots. So this cellar was all one set, these stairs down into the cellar. Now this is upstairs. There was a much bigger upstairs. We cut a lot of the shot, stuff we shot upstairs. I regret cutting it because it was visually wonderful, but it didn't have any laughs in it. And I was under pressure from the studio and from the producers to keep it moving. It's the great god momentum. I think we lost a lot of visual interest from the film by cutting it as tightly as we did. Um, and one of the big challenges of this film, because it's all set in in one big set, was the, to keep the film visually interesting. And um, so we focused a lot on keeping the camera moving. Right. Um, um, Victor Kemper was wonderful at that. And he it was my first film. He taught me all about all about that.
So very soon after this, we have the... Oh, this is the ballroom. Right. So the ballroom is the only room that we was not built on the set. There was no room for that. The ballroom was the room at the big mansion of Pasadena where we shot a couple of the arrival shots. Right, right. And we went there for a day. Just one day to shoot all of that stuff? Yes. Wow. So this was a real ballroom. I can't even conceive of just the, the continuity. Colonel Mustard's tie is slightly askew there and it's got to be the same way in all the connecting scenes. We had a wonderful continuity lady called Doris Grau who was a, in her 60s or 70s and uh, was sort of had a voice like Jimmy Durante. And uh, well, if she noticed something wrong, as she did a couple of times just before we shot, she would leap to her feet and shout, Stop the presses! <laughs> <laughs> and... Uh, but she missed just about nothing. She was quite extraordinary. Mm. And, of course, all of this is done without playback. Of course, yeah. So in those days, the continuity person really had to see everything because you didn't... There was no way to double-check it right. until you saw dailies the next day. And that was usually too late to correct something. But yeah, with this with this schedule, you can't well, with any, any time. But, but with any film, here, I mean, right? now p continuity people rely on video playback. I think too much. It used to be the continuity person would prowl the set and check out every detail and take Polaroids of every actor. And they knew exactly what the continuity was. Right. It's a very, very difficult job. It's easier now. Here's Bill Henderson. He played the cop. Uh, he was, apart from being an actor, he was a very good jazz singer. He made a um, lovely record with the uh, Oscar Peterson trio. So these secret passages, of course, were all in the board game. And there was a really dramatic and wonderful shot here, which I had to cut, when after the most tourist is hit on the head, after this shot, he fell into shot with his, with a, his head covered in blood and a big close-up and it was a great shot and we were ordered to take it out or else we wouldn't get a PG rating. Wow. So I was very sad about that. It was a really dramatic and exciting shot. Of course, now that would be nothing. Nothing. It would be nothing. Um, so the conservatory is on the set. Um, and that opening scene with Mr. Body running towards the, wind, the, the, the glass there and the dogs was just put in because I needed to have some more action in the conservatory. There's, right. You know, most of the action takes place in two or three of the rooms. But the conservatory is essential because that's where the secret passage begins. Yep. And I believe that's on the board game. Um, yes. And also part of the fourth ending takes place in the conservatory. And again, if you want to learn, learn more about the fourth ending, there's a Wikipedia mention of it and there's... Uh, you know, you can just read about it online. It's in the novelization if you can get your hands on it. That's all news to me. <laughs> I just noticed, is that another painting of, of the butler? I don't think so. Uh, looks like the one in the dining room, just a little. This is a great bit of physical comedy here. So that collision is very well done. That's four stunt doubles. Yeah, if you look closely. If you look very closely, you can see it, but nobody... I, actually, I can't really tell. One of my favorite lines coming up here from Professor Plum. So, oh, and there's the shot that gets the chandelier. So that sh hits the chandelier, and now 
people ask me sometimes, how did we engineer this chandelier? And the answer is, I don't really remember. But it was on a series of pulleys. The first thing was what made it revolve. Then we had to do shots of the cable uncoiling. And then we, when we did the final crash down, um, we had to make sure that it landed close enough to the actors. Um, and actually, Colonel Mustard was a little, looks a little too far from it for my taste. I was playing it mm. very, very safe. Um, I sh we should have perhaps used a lens that foreshortened it so it made him look closer to the impact. Um, you can see a little bit of the blood coming down. You can see the blood there on his there. face, yes. And it looks like Colonel Mustard, he wasn't perhaps shot, but it looks like the bullet whizzed by his shoulder or he caught his jacket somewhere. Oh, no, that's not a bullet. That was the, um, that's just something from the chandelier. Oh, OK. Because he says, I've been shot, and I thought maybe... Oh, just, it, oh that's right. Yes, it, it, yeah. it, hit the, um, it hit the jacket. That's right. exactly right. Thank you. I've forgotten that. I have actually answered the door like that a number of times since I've seen this movie. I don't care who it is. Every now and then I feel like it and I just open it and close it immediately. Yeah. It's very interesting to me in all these group shots how the actors are all playing the same thing and they all play it differently. Right. They all have an objection, but they're all playing it. They're all playing it their own way, in right. their own character. That kind of business is easier to do on stage where everybody can see all the action. Right. It's quite tricky to work out exactly how to cut it so that it seemed immediate and the audience feels they're seeing it all happening at the same time. How did you come to cast him? Bill? Yeah. Uh, I think he was suggested by Deborah as well. Hmm. You know, it's very hard to remember. It's uh, 30 years ago. That's a good topical line even now. That's exactly right. Nothing changes. Hmm.
So I had to figure out how to show these bodies and make it look not suspicious to the cop. Right. Which and I was very pleased with the result. Yeah, and the music adds a lot to it as well when they put the record on. It's very, very clever. That's actually quite horrifying, but it's hilarious. It's horrifying, yeah. Time. Very dark humor. And, and I particularly like this. Uh, yeah. This shot. <laughs> you get so much just from Michael McKean's reactions there. Now, would there have been huge gaps in, in the shooting schedule for people like Jeffrey Kramer and Lee Ving? Who, I really don't remember, right, but I right. expect so. Yeah. Especially if you were planning to shoot it in order at the beginning. In theory, they would have had to come back, play a dead body again. Yes, I really have no idea. So I chose Shaboom, which works very well, because it was because Paramount wouldn't give me any money for recorded music, and that was the cheapest song we could find really? from the fifties. <laughs> it cost almost nothing. <laughs> <laughs> Again, I guess it's necessity is the mother of invention. With the titles and with this, it all works. Yes, well, fine. Yes. Do you think the fact that you were running out of time towards the end actually really helped that sort of frenetic energy? For No, I think it made it much harder. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah, because it, it, it meant the actors didn't have as much time to understand what they were playing and think what they were doing, and I didn't have time for some of the shots I wanted. Mm. Um, running out of time is really never a good thing. You know, this was a very big shot, but because, I, I mean, just the scope of it, the lighting, the big room and everything, and they're just... Wasn't time for many shots like that. Right. You know, then you jump to the kitchen and this all has to be lit. People don't really understand that making a film is as much about photography as about everything else. <laughs> um, it's no good that the actors are acting well or being funny or whatever if they're not photographed well. Right. And photography is about lighting and lighting takes time. Less time now than it used to. Sure. So that was another matte painting again, of course. And now, now all of these had to be set up and shot separately. So this was very time consuming. That shot used to get big laughs. <laughs> and now this voice coming up. Oh, no, it's later. This one. Yes, the voice of the murderer there, I think, is me, but I, I'm not quite sure. Right. Obviously, it's it's got to be ambiguous enough that you have no idea who exactly. it is. Exactly, yes. 
It was a strange, difficult problem that getting the tone right between oh, all of these shots you see had to be done separately mm -hmm. in different places in order to set up the singing telegram. <laughs> that gets a big laugh whenever, whenever you see this. Um, what was a problem was creating the right balance between tension and comedy. Right. Uh, I wanted it to feel tense or else it would just be pointless. You know, the audience has to has to understand their sense of fear. At the same time, you still have to keep punctuating it with the laughs because it's a comedy. Interest comedy thrillers are an interesting balance. So the shot was obviously designed so that to remind the audience where everyone had been. Yeah, but they're and they're close enough, like because a lot of people think, oh, how did Mrs. White get downstairs and then back upstairs? But it starts with they're just close enough that they could have realistically gotten anywhere they needed to. That's right. And I like the fact that at this point they're so blousy about the dead bodies that they don't really care much anymore. Especially later when they, they dump the singing telegram in the study. They literally just drop yes. her in there. Yeah, they're, you know, getting used to having all these bodies around. They're shell-shocked by now. The hysteria's gone and it's now shell shock. Mm -hmm. And, of course, from this point forward, just in terms of continuity, Tim Curry's hair and face had to be wet, I guess, before each take. Yes. <laughs> now, when he says it's getting serious, there used to be a line there was, this is, this is beyond a joke, but that's not an American idiom. Nobody in America understood it, so right. I had to change it to this is serious. Now, did you have preview screenings on this? We did. We had uh, two or three preview screenings, right. uh, as a result of which we kept trimming the film and making it shorter and faster, mm. I think to its detriment, because it didn't change the screening scores at all. I mean, even without the music, this all feels kind of musical, like it has a real rhythm to it. Well, this was a brave choice that John and I made here, which was to play it with this music, to play the music as loud as this and to, as it were, make this into a choreographed musical mm. sequence. I think this, is, uh, th this made it seem quite crazy to a number of people, although I think it really works. I love it. But obviously, if you're creating this from scratch, you'd have the music first, and then you'd have people... No, the music afterwards. No, but I know, but that's what I'm saying. That makes it even more tricky to do.
I'm getting caught up watching it. I'm forgetting to talk. <laughs> what did you say? I'm getting caught up watching it. I'm forgetting to oh, comment. Right. <laughs> so, it was those shots that took a lot of planning. In other words, who wasn't there right. was key to how the whole script was worked out. And also crucial, I guess, in the editing because you, you can't use too many wide shots with that because it becomes too obvious. It's yeah, it, absolutely. Yeah. Well, I, I shot it so as to make sure there weren't any shots like that that we couldn't use. Right. Now, in the fourth ending, he is the murderer. Um... So that's that's kind of amusing because they even yes uh, yeah yes that's not a problem because no not at all because he would have lied yeah but you remember what's in the fourth ending and I don't well very briefly and again you can go online and have a look and learn more about it but very briefly he does the whole here's how it was done and he tries to pin it on Professor Plum and Mrs Peacock working together and they say wait we didn't do it and he says no you did and then Professor Plum says whoever's got the gun shot the girl. And then Wadsworth, who still is the butler, reveals it was him and that he poisoned all of them with champagne so he could show them how he committed the perfect series of murders and then leave them to die without the antidote. And then he tries to escape. You can read yeah. the rest of it. But it, it, when we put it together, it didn't strike me as that funny. Right. And so I just dropped it. I think three endings feels pretty good too. Yes. Now, it was your idea during the home video release to actually put them in the order they were in? Well, I wanted them all to be released uh, together when the film came out because I thought it was a mistake to show them in different endings to different theatres and I was proved right on that because what happened was that it discouraged people from going to the film at all. They right. didn't know which ending to go and see. And I think they also took the view, not unreasonably, that if the filmmakers don't know how to end the film... Maybe it's not worth going to see. Right. So the idea, which was purely commercial, which was if we have three different endings, people will go three times, proved to be a terrible mistake. I had a, a feeling that this might happen, but more than that, I felt that each ending, although amusing, was fine. But what made all the endings so excellent, in my opinion... My own opinion was was that um, the fact that it was possible to construct this film and have three endings that all worked and that were all different, all logically possible. So for me, the interest was in putting all three endings together and showing the ingenuity of it. And I think that's why the film didn't work in the movie theatres and subsequently was such a success on television and in video. Right. Because you saw all three endings and you saw how they all worked in conjunction with each other. And would you have put them in the same order? I suppose you would have. Because this, the, yes, uh, as, the as they order. are on the yeah. video is how I would have, uh, is how I thought it should have been released in the cinema. I was persuaded not. Um, and uh, I made a mistake going along with it. Here's a joke that Michael McKean put in. He was thrown into the toilet. And now he comes out having, <laughs> having had a pee and wa washed his hands. <laughs> Did you know he was going to do that? Yeah, he told me. He told me at least. Okay. Uh, yeah, otherwise, I would have cut already. Right. Yeah, you were saying there's really very little room for improvisation because everything had to be just so. But I guess there are a, 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 there just are, a few there were, small the, the moments. There are jokes here and there, yes, yeah. but, but very little. Martin Mull with uh, When I Lost My Mummy and Daddy. That's right. That line was When I Lost My Parents. He changed it to Mummy and Daddy, which I thought was funnier from coming from the Colonel. And of course, uh, coming up a little later, the infamous Madeleine Kahn's Flames line. Yes. You can, you can buy that on T-shirts, posters. It's, it's become such a, a moment for people. In fact, I don't know if you know this, there's a gallery in uh, West Hollywood called Gallery 1988, and they had a whole Clue exhibition about a year ago where just all these different artists put out all this Clue artwork. Somebody sent me something about that online. Yes, mm. I did see that. 
There's a new soft furnishings company somewhere that's selling cushions with all the women's faces. <laughs> I saw that online too. Wow. I bought a poster that's a blueprint of the uh, of the ground of of the rooms and has all the endings connected with all these different. So this is where Colonel Mustard is admitting he was a war profiteer, which of course there were plenty of people like that. Of course. And still are. Now, this, of course, is be just before Back to the Future came out, so Christopher Lloyd wasn't yet as big a star as I guess he was. After no, that. this was right, right before Back to the Future. Now, is this, there's a lot of very interesting artwork and, and sort of antique pieces throughout. Is, is that real or? I have no idea. I can't remember. It may have been painted by the art department, may have been found in old antique shops in Pasadena, probably a combination of the two. I'm I'm shocked when I see this film how little America has changed in the last 30 years. <laughs> By this time we were shooting all of these scenes out of sequence just in lighting order. Right, right. Which made it extremely difficult for the actors, but they were they triumphed over it. Now this is the point at which the the endings all diverge. Yes. It's that when he turns the lights back on.
You always see something new. That's the first time I've seen the lint come out of Martin Mull's pocket. <laughs> That's a line in Alfred Hitchcock's great film North by Northwest mm. in which uh, it's explained to Cary Grant that the, orig the, the what's on the microfilm is secrets. And that's the whole MacGuffin, as right. Hitchcock called it. So, of course, I took that from, and used it here. This is another one of those great lines. Yeah, nothing's changed. Nothing's changed. <laughs> See everybody else trying to figure it out in the background too. Yeah. <laughs> she played that beautifully. And all one shot again. I mean, I don't know if you did shoot coverage of that, but obviously, I, I I mean, if you did, I don't know. Yeah, it plays so much better just as one. So that one was a lot closer. Yes, but we knew it was safe right. because the colonel wasn't moving. Right, right, right. So we established where he was and where it would land and it would be absolutely safe for him. Tim is quite extraordinary in this sequence. He speaks so fast, has so much to learn, so much action to do, mm. and it's all clear. He's got all these marks to hit, too, I guess, that you couldn't put yeah, on the floor. Yes, tremendous precision. Absolute great demonstration of precision in acting. <laughs> I just noticed that. <laughs> Did you see that? Yes. <laughs> Colonel Mustard adjusting his underwear. Yes. Had a wedgie. Yeah. I swear, I've seen this movie... Countless times, I never noticed that until this moment. <laughs> also, when she's unmasked, she takes off her glasses. I just realized that. What did you say? Uh, Eileen Brennan, when he says, you murder them all, she takes off her glasses. Yes. Yeah. I think Christopher Lloyd does the same thing in the third ending.
And Madeline started putting in the, uh, the round there. Yeah. Yeah, so she has the peacock blue car. Yes, that's right. Now, in the script, he actually shoots her here, which would have been quite dark, I think. Yes, but I cut it just before the yeah. shot because it seemed... And added that line, I, I assume. It seemed like a bad idea to shoot her dead when we put it in front of an audience. Right. And this seemed to me this was the best ending, so I put this last mm. when I put it all together. And it's cut the fastest as well, obviously. My wife is a shrink, so I had to put in some psychiatrist jokes. <laughs> Now, one question I admit I yeah. always had is how he knew about the secret passage. How who knew? How Colonel Mustard knew. Um, but again, got he, found, me. he found the conservatory one by accident, so it once. Well, we don't know that he found to. it by accident. Yeah, that's true. Yes, the, the fact he calls, uh, says she's stupping Yvette is just nothing to do with the fact that Madeline played Lily von Stupp in another movie by Mel Brooks. Mm. This line, of course, is improv <laughs> I wanted her to, to do two versions, her improv version and what was written. But after we shot... Her version, I thought it was so funny, we never shot the other. Right. It's become one of those great quotable lines.
I like his sporting response to being shot. <laughs> Good shot, Crane. Of course, what's very, very clever about Wadsworth not being Wadsworth is that in this version, legitimately, everybody is not being addressed by their real name. <laughs> well, here we are, 31 years later. Well, I'm just very happy that people still enjoy it, and I'm very happy that a lot of the jokes seem as topical now as they did when I wrote them. Mm. And I think the cast were really wonderful and give an object lesson in how to play fast, which is with the utmost seriousness, never ever suggesting for a moment that what they are doing is funny to them. Well, listen, thank you so much if you've been watching along and listening. Just so thrilled to have the opportunity, and hopefully in another 30 years we'll still be watching this movie. Well, thank you very much for setting this up, Josh, and uh, I've enjoyed watching it again. <laughs> I hope everybody else continues to enjoy it. All right, that's it from us. Thank you very much. <laughs>